So yeah, without further ado, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to have uh, George Dante here, who is the uh, founder of Wildlife Preservations. Uh, it's based in West Patterson, New Jersey. Um, he'll tell you much more about his work, but um, it's an unbelievably wide-ranging design practice going from uh, sculpture to painting to uh, you know, structural engineers, uh, sort of small-scale architecture, uh, doing things for clients such as museums, including the American Museum of Natural History, uh, the Museum of Primatology, if that exists up in, in Harvard, um, what is it called again? It's the uh, Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. Comparative Zoology, excuse me. <laughs> and um, uh, also private clients, I was, I was interested to hear that uh, those include Bill Gates and Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, maybe you did Donald Trump's hair? Uh, no. <laughs> and uh, so we can, we can we maybe ask you about those in the Q&A. Yeah, I mean, for since since a little kid, I, I, I was a little kid. I've been going to natural history museums, and now that I'm a new New Yorker, uh, my wife and I are members at the Natural History Museum, and if, uh, go up whenever we can. Um, and you've got some uh, renovation work uh, uh, underway that uh, will be interesting to hear about. And uh, after a pretty wide-ranging slideshow that we'll we'll aim to keep in about 25 minutes or so, we can then open up to a conversation with you guys and. Uh, find out more, uh, whatever questions you might have, whether it's uh, the artificial rock works or the uh, UV resistant fake snow. <laughs> um, all of these little design touches sound pretty fascinating to discuss. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to George and um, your mic's over there if you, if you can get it. Great, everybody, hear me okay? Okay. First, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it and it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. So I grew up just completely in love with nature. I was, completely obsessed with it. I loved being outdoors and basically painted and sculpted from the time I could walk. I knew in my life I wanted to do something with art and science uh, and early on I actually found the art of taxidermy and found that to be a perfect marriage of the two. So as I uh, as I grew, I, I actually started my company, Wildlife Preservations, while I was in high school. Started in junior year of high school. Uh, started building a clientele base. Uh, I attended the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. Uh, got a four-year degree there. And then while I was working through college, I amassed such a backlog of clients that my plan was to graduate, finish up my backlog, and then pursue a career in the commercial art field. Well, I'm still trying to finish up that backlog of clients and um, think maybe it's time to, uh, to put the idea of becoming a commercial artist aside. I, I'm, I'm very pleased on what, where I've gone. I'm so happy to be doing what I do. I wake up in the morning and I cannot wait to get to work. It's so exciting because our work now is so diverse that we still uh, hold on to our roots, where we still do taxidermy for museums and private clients. But on the other end of the spectrum, we'll be doing rock work for a theme park, for private clients. I, it's just amazing. I never know what's going to happen when our phone rings, and I look forward to it. I love the challenge. Uh, what I did is I put together some slides. There's a lot of them here. We'll run through them pretty quick, and we'll get on to some questions and answers. But I tried to put some things together that would basically um, give you a little idea of some of our more commercial work, um, what we do for private clients, museums, and theme parks, and kind of hopefully tailored to uh, where your backgrounds are. So we'll take a look at that, we'll start, and uh, if, uh, if I'm going too fast, I apologize. So this is a quick overview of what we have. We're going to cover rock work, we're going to cover landforms and environments, we're going to go over trees, water, models, and sculpture. And again, this is just a small portion of what we do. We could spend days just going over some of the projects and, and what exactly we, uh, we do on a daily basis. So let's start out with the rock work first. Rock work is huge, especially it's becoming even larger today for architects, um, landscape designers. Rock work, uh, as far as artificial rock work, started huge on the west coast and is slowly creeping east here. Uh, it's big on the west coast because they don't have the winters, they don't have the fluctuation in the temperature, so the rock's a lot more stable when you build it out there. Here we have to contend with the ground heaving. Um, we've worked in some issues, uh, we worked out some issues and ways to remedy that, um, but more and more people are, are getting interested in that as far as private homeowners, so we'll take a look at some stuff. Um, the first project we have here is a residential pool room. This is a private client 
in Connecticut that had an indoor pool. They were installing the pool, wanted to have this uh, amazing rock formation um, going around the pool and actually hiding a slide. They have a water slide that's on the side there that they wanted to cover with the rock work so it wasn't so obtrusive to, uh, to view this. The rock work is done basically, we'll just go back to that. Um, standard process for doing concrete rock. We do rocks in several different mediums depending on the job, the budget. Standard concrete is basically um, steel armature, rebar. Um, we, uh, we put some wire lath or chicken wire over it, shoot one coat of shotcrete over it, and then start sculpting into a second coat of shotcrete. That's basically the second coat of shotcrete after the sculptures began. The, uh, the artist will actually uh, wait for the concrete to start to firm up a little bit and carve in and trowel all of that rock work, the texture. They'll use brooms, paint brushes, uh, sticks, I mean just <laughs> an amazing array of tools to, uh, to get the textures in there. Once the concrete dries, it's painted and sealed. One of my favorite pieces of this environment was the railing going up the side. The client loved the rock work. The only thing they did not want is a conventional steel railing going up the side of it and just killing the atmosphere of the piece. So we actually took a piece of steel, bent it, come around, anchored it into the rock and actually sculpted a tree branch uh, over this and, and made some nice roots coming down at the bottom there. So that's, uh, that's a piece of steel with a sculpted epoxy over the top of it. And actually since this project that has become very, very popular. Now everybody, everybody wants sculpted railings. <laughs> Once, uh, one thing we did very different from this, from what we've seen before is uh, the client wanted a lot of greenery in the rock work, which is nice because once rock work uh, is done, usually the contractor will leave it, it's rock, and you lose a lot of, uh, a lot of feel to it if it being outdoors because there's nothing on it, there's nothing growing on it. It, it. it tends to look like a quarry, or if it's not done right, it tends to look like a bad miniature golf course. So what we did is we actually purchased uh, several types of artificial plants from some of our wholesalers and then just started uh, laying in plants uh, all in the rocks, the crevices. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's really brought the piece to life, whereas you have you know, little ferns creeping out of the crevices. Uh, we've actually altered a number of the artificial plants to make smaller, little, uh, more native looking plants out of those. There's liking on the rocks. Uh, just little details like that, I think, really push the piece over. Some of the details up close, the texture of the rock. I mean, we really go all out. If you're gonna do it, you know, do it right. So the little moss creeping through the crevice of the rocks, the tiny plants, right down to the grass, which is completely artificial, of course, and artificial dead grass in between it, really pushes it over. Mixing the two uh, really make a huge difference. The room itself was a, a beautiful space. There you can see the, the pool all laid out and uh, the large tree. They, the client was so happy, they had these planters off to the side that their landscaper was supposed to come in and put live plants in. They had decided on getting some trees and, uh, well, they saw the artificial plants. They loved it so much that they actually decided to have us continue, put the artificial tree in, and finish out the flower boxes because it's low maintenance, it'll never change. Uh, it's completely washable, you could hose it down. Uh, it is, uh, it, it's, it's just more attractive. Okay. That's just a close up one of the little planter boxes. And again, we can make these as wild looking or as uh, uh, you can make uh, topiaries. I mean, it, it's just limitless. This waterfall. This was this was an interesting project. <clears throat> a lot of the jobs we do are problem solving jobs, which are, are great. I, I really enjoy doing that. We get a call from one of our landscape architects. He says we have a client that uh, we just had a waterfall installed in the side of their house, and they hate it. <laughs> it, it they were hoping for this grand water feature. Um, they they hired one of the best pond building companies in New Jersey, and he said. We basically wanted to kill the guy. The clients just were beside themselves. 
they have a, a little sunroom in the back and there's a hot tub in the sunroom. What you're seeing in that open area is the bottom of the hot tub. The rock work was supposed to cover all of that. You have outlets. It was just absolutely horrible. The clients were devastated. So the clients, after speaking to them, they wanted some grand rock waterfall. They're telling me they want to hear splashing water. They want three outlets of water coming down. And that's what they got. So where this is, this is in the backyard. It's, it's a tight area to go through. You can't get heavy equipment back there. You can't get the large boulders back there. And you could never get the boulders to stack up the way they wanted be, without it looking like piled boulders. Um, you see that a lot in landscape water features. They, they tend to look like rocks cemented together because that's basically what they are. So what we did in this situation is we, we went there, we started uh, taking measurements, and I went back to our studio and just sculpted a quick scale model. Because of budget reasons, the client didn't want to have blueprints drawn again. They wanted to do this as quick as they could, as cheap as they could, and as fast as they could without really going through a lot of, uh, a lot of hoopla in the design. So we banged out a quick scale model, sent it to them for their approval, did some drawings, figure out what they wanted, where they wanted to make changes. As you can see, this is very crude. So a lot of architect students, uh, architecture students will look at this and say, what the hell, this is not approved blueprints, this is, there's nothing technical here. That's the beauty of our work sometimes, is it's, it's, it's fun, it doesn't have to be exact science. Sometimes it cannot be, because of what we're, what we're dealing with. We went back to the place and basically did a cardboard, <laughs> cardboard template of what we needed to build. Where the outlets were, um, and what we decided is the best way to build this is to do a uh, a rock waterfall in our studio and build it out of rock panels. Now we have molds of artificial uh, of rock that we cast off of real structures. We can cut up these molds, piece them together. We have flat rock panels that we can make three dimensional rocks out of. So we decided this was the best thing to do. We'd make it hollow, a shell that would just fit into that space. It's light, we can, with four guys, we can carry it into the backyard. It's, we build it out of fiberglass so it's strong. Um, it's not gonna, they're not gonna have a problem with the winters because it's fiberglass. We build it in such a way and reinforce it so you really have minimal cracking. Uh, and we integral colored it so if they have guests that get a little crazy and decide to climb on top of it or throw things at it, it's gonna, it's gonna withstand uh, any abuse. So we brought that back to our studio, refined it a little bit and, uh, and started construction. I don't have any process shots, I apologize, but that's the feature after it was done. Basically, that is a hollow structure. The back is, is completely hollow. It's maybe an inch and a half to two inches thick, the entire thing. There's some small rocks that you see that are actually glued in place. Those are artificial rocks that are cast from some of our other molds. Um, we have uh, tubing going actually into several different locations and fill boxes where the water will fill up and then spill over. There's ball valves on the tubing, so the client can actually go in there and control the flow. So you could, you could actually have this feature just spewing out water like Niagara Falls. I mean, we, we actually had it to a point where, I mean, this thing was just dropping water like crazy. They love it. Or you can actually tone, tone it back a little bit and have these quiet little trickles coming down. So the clients just absolutely were, were so happy with the piece. I, I don't have a photo of the finished. I, I wish I had that with me tonight, but our, the landscaper went back in and then started installing plants all over it, real plant work. So they actually have some ivy. They put aquatic plants into it. It really looks fantastic. Uh, the original design actually had planter boxes in there. We can build planter boxes into the rock work, um, but for budget reasons, they had to eliminate them. But the landscaper came in and found ways to put plants into these crevices, and they, they look absolutely fantastic. Real plants. Real plants, yes. And the real plants will grow very well around that fiberglass rock. Matter of fact, that rock, you can actually even get moss to grow on that. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's amazing. So that was a very satisfying piece to do. The clients were just blown away after what they had before. So this is one of the pieces that was, was another problem-solving situation, the T-Rex Mountain. 
Basically, we did not do the rock work for this project. We worked with a, a company that's owned by a very good friend of mine, which again is a very interesting success story. He started out as a taxidermist and wanted to make artificial rocks to put in habitats with animals. 20 years later, he's building mountains. He did uh, a number of uh, miniature golf courses on Carnival Cruise Lines. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing where, where it's taken him. So the T-Rex restaurant is, uh, it is a chain of restaurants, and this is in downtown Disney. What they wanted, they wanted to put a replica of this mountain on the roof of their restaurant. So, okay, you look at it, what are we gonna do on the roof? You can't put shotcrete up on the roof. You can't build a concrete mountain up on the roof because of the weight. The lightweight stuff that they looked at was just subpar, so they, so they looked to my friend's company to look for something a little bit better. He did a great job. The rock is actually, again, cast panels. Those are a sample of the panels right there. As you can see, this mountain was built out of panels that are just maybe two inches thick. It's, it's integral colored fiberglass, and it's fiberglass reinforced in the back. We actually got the panels because what he hired us to do is do the snow work on this. So here's the situation. Most of the snow in Disney is um, white mortar, white concrete, and they wanted to do something that looked more realistic. No one could come up with something. So they came to us and said, what can we do? Well, I know the snow we used for indoor applications, um, but I did not know how it would hold up over time. So we spent months doing research trying to find a snow that would be UV stable, that would withstand the winds in Florida, withstand the rain in Florida, withstand the heat, and is not gonna turn yellow in a couple years. The UV stability was a big thing because most of the snow out there is not UV stable. So we went to work doing some experimentation and started coming up with, uh, with ways to do this. The other unique thing is the mountain itself um, is, um, is very special in the way the snow sits on it. The snow is wind driven, so the snow on this mountain is, is just wild. It looks like it's been plastered on in some areas. It looks like subtle drifts in other areas. It's really quite beautiful but challenging. So once we, we did a couple sample panels for them. The problem with the, uh, with the mountain on the roof also is that it didn't have, it didn't cast the right shadows on itself. Uh, so they actually wanted us to do some test panels with a shadow, where we actually had to go and airbrush in and paint in shadows that would be cast as if it were the mountain, where the sun would rotate around it and cast these cool shadows that they wanted. So that's a sample that we made up of the, uh, of the snow and the shadows. By the way, after they got the, the budget numbers for that, they decided they didn't need shadows. <laughs> yep. Yep. Amazing. Uh, but the details, the details were very nice. Uh, once we developed the snow, we were very pleased with it. It, it was translucent, uh, it, it's UV stable, it's extremely strong, it could be washed, it's, uh, it, it did everything we wanted it to. So the mountain itself was built inside a warehouse up in Massachusetts. We went up there and actually started building the snow drifts right on this thing. We wanted to get a head start before we got down to Florida. So what we did for the large drifts is we actually uh, foamed in, which is a two-part urethane foam that we poured expands uh, onto, these, uh, onto these ledges and where the mountain was. Um, talk about your blueprints. We get a blueprint of this mountain with red snow areas. That's what we need to do. So now we have to look at this thing and try to figure out where this piece of rock is, where this crevice is, and start laying up this snow on there. It's a shot at the top of the mountain. The building wasn't big enough to build the entire mountain intact. Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was actually done very well, though. It really worked out very well. That's the mountain on top of the roof. Um, it was an interesting structure. To make this thing very strong, um, some very, very simple but effective engineering was done. There's steel plates, fiberglass into the rock panels, and there's an enormous uh, I-beam armature inside there. And once the, um, once the mountain was reassembled on the top of the roof, welders went in place and inserted I-beams into the metal receivers that are fiberglass into the panels and welded it in place. So there's a, a very elaborate steel structure going to all the panels to make sure that this thing isn't going to wind up all over downtown Disney. Very challenging work. Our guys literally had to climb this mountain. As you can see, the, 
The scaffolding only went so far before we, we had to get out on there. The snow had to be, be applied by hand. That was one of the biggest challenges. The snow was, in, it was a urethane material, so we actually had to mix this stuff in small quantities. In the Florida heat, it was setting like crazy. We had to hoist it up to our guys, and they were literally trying to apply this in such a way where it looked like the mountain. They had the photos of the real mountain with them. It was, um, it was a project I'll never take again. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But the, uh, but the results were great. The clients were very pleased. That's the finished snow. I think we went back and did a few other touch-ups on there, but, um, but it, it actually worked out very, very well. They were very happy with it. Some of the close-ups of some of the details. It was fun. So landforms and environments. Basically, we could be called upon to do any type of landform. There's literally no limits to what you can recreate. Absolutely anything. So a couple years ago, we did uh, the Darwin exhibit for the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, it was a very popular exhibit. We wound up building like three or four of them for them. So this was a fun exhibit because the landforms were pretty unique. They were all either Galapagos Island uh, landforms or um, South American um, pieces. I mean, really, really a lot of fun to build. And it will really show you some of, some of the different techniques we use. Um, the main method of building these was actually carved foam, which is very nice. It's, it's easy to work with and that can give you really nice results. So this is uh, just one of, the, one of the landforms we did. These are actually models of uh, the giant and dwarf armadillos that we built as well. We built a lot of models for the exhibit as well. This is one of my favorite pieces. Um, two land iguanas are supposed to go on here. It was a really beautiful uh, rock formation and a lot of fun to carve. <laughs> so as you can see, these are, these are made out of billets of white styrofoam, which is actually extruded polystyrene. Um, name brand is, I believe it is just called styrofoam. That's the brand name of it. Um, we purchased it from lumber yards. It's used in insulation today. Um, we start out with a, with a plywood, plywood base. Uh, in situations like this, it's, it's two pieces of three-quarter inch plywood, furniture grade plywood. Um, and then we start to uh, foam the pieces together using two-part urethane foam to glue, it to glue it together. And then start the carving. And again, it's, it's just all done handwork using chisels, uh, little rasps, and some very interesting homemade tools as well. This is, uh, this is the structure as the dirt's going on it. Basically what we did, what you're not seeing here, is we actually sprayed the structure down with, um, I believe it was thin set. We actually watered it down and got, to, got it to spray through a hopper gun for us, and then started to throw on dirt onto this. It's literally the most fun you could possibly have in a shop, because you need to get the dirt to go onto it and stick to this thing, because the thin set is not that sticky. So we are literally spent two days reapplying and throwing dirt into this. Once the excess dirt's removed, we actually coat the entire structure with uh, watered down owner's glue. Great material, works fantastic, and uh, it, it's, it's very, very durable, believe it or not. Grass was applied to them. We used a mixture of real and artificial grasses in this. Because it's for a museum, we had to be very careful. The grasses could be nondescript. We had to make sure there were no seed heads visible or that they could not be identified by a botanist. So that's a challenge in itself, yeah. You know, some of the other landforms we did were some volcanic areas. Uh, the, this was for the, uh, the marine iguanas. And this was, used, this was a uh, carved foam structure. And over the top of it is going just latex house paint mixed with paint. Makes an incredible, durable surface. It's, it's a nightmare to apply, but it makes a very, very durable surface and works great for a situation like this when you're recreating uh, that volcanic rock. That was the finished structure. The lighting is a little rough in here, but there's little, there's some really nice color changes in there. We, we actually applied some, some algae in there. It's, it's a really nice piece. That's just an overview of what we had going on there. Just, I mean, just some really nice landforms and absolute disaster to our studio. How many ways do you have? 
I'm sorry? How many uh, employees are there who actually we have uh, our employees fluctuate depending on the projects we have, but normally we usually keep a staff of about five to six guys going. Mm -hmm. Just another little shot of these. This was a South American landform for a, uh, a greater Rio was going on this. And the challenge is that this is an open air exhibit. These are not going behind glass. So this is going into an open air exhibit. A lot of museum traveling exhibits now are open air. They're they're kind of, which it's sad, they're kind of getting away from dioramas. So, you know, the public does all kinds of things. I mean, they found soda cans in, in the exhibits. You know, somebody will lift their child up over the rail and the kid's climbing on the thing. So traveling exhibits get a tremendous amount of abuse. So when they look to us for this, they need to know this thing is going to last. Usually these go all over the world because Darwin one I think traveled all over the world and it has to travel for seven years. So for seven years this thing has to be crated, uncrated. Crated and uncrated by sometimes inexperienced people. Um, it, it really takes a hell of a beating. So these things need to be extremely durable. All the grass, all the loose material you see on there needs to be glued down, but of course not look like it's glued down. So it's, it's quite a challenge. This was uh, the base for a daisy tree we fabricated. Just a different, you know, different area, very rich soil. Um, this was almost like a, uh, where the daisy trees are, it's almost a little rainforest uh, area. Very moist, very wet. We actually have little, it's hard to see, but there's little, little springs coming down with artificial water dripping through there. It's a little close up of it. Okay, what are holding up? This is, this is something that we do for private clients that are sportsmen. Um, more and more of the sporting community we see that we do taxidermy for want more of these crazy exhibits built in their homes. The, it's, it, it, it has blown my mind. So we were actually hired, again, back to the problem solving, we were hired by another taxidermy studio that had a very wealthy client that wanted this little nook built into their home. It's a brownstone right off of, um, it's right off of Broadway, um, and it's, they, they restored the entire brownstone. They wanted some of their animals put into this little environment. So it was kind of out of the realm of what this taxidermy studio did, so they called us. We did a couple quick sketches, and then the client basically said, build what you like. Do what you want, and you know, give us a price, and go from there. So, of course, we couldn't go crazy, but we, uh, we did something conservative, but, uh, but something the client was happy with. When we got there, they have this, uh, this little kidney shaped, what looked like a pool, ready to go into this thing. Um, this was completed. The client had uh, an alligator that he wanted to put inside this thing. So they wanted, yeah, exactly. So th basically what they said, they want all the area around there to look like a, like just typical African habitat, some scrub bushes, some, some rocks, some small plants, and they wanted the interior of that to look like a pond. They wanted lily pads in there, they wanted the roots coming out. So we said, all right, no problem. Um, one of the challenges uh, to this, there's the structure. Uh, his contractor put this in, did a great job. There's electrical hookups in there for lights because they had actually little lights to illuminate the alligator once it was in there. And there's a recessed lip you'll see there. Once the thing was done, they actually had a company cut a piece of plexiglass that fit into the top of this because when they had a dinner party, they wanted their guests to be able to walk over the top of this and look down inside of it. Oh yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is the home. There's no access to this place. It's a brownstone. So we literally have to carry all our materials and everything down the staircase that was just finished. The, I mean, the staircase alone was just gorgeous. I mean, the woodwork in the place was unbelievable. And we have guys mixing concrete in here. It was, um, it was nerve wracking. What we did, we put some plywood down so they could remove this if they ever needed to. That was the most important thing is, Am I going to take this person's home and start putting stuff in permanent? I don't like doing that. If it's removable, if the guy ever changes his mind, he's not cursing me that I just screwed up his house. So this was an important part to me, is to make it removable. So we laid some plywood down, we made sure it fit like a puzzle, the pieces would come apart if they ever needed to move this. We started laying in some plants. We harvest a lot of our own materials, a lot of our dried natural materials. We harvest ourselves, we dry them, bug-proof them. 
um, laying some of the plants in there. Just started having fun, really. Little almost finished section there. Basically, for the, for the dirt, what you see, we wanted to make it extremely durable because he said he has a cleaning crew that comes in to clean the place. This is just a, this brownstone, they do not live there. This is just so when they go to a Broadway play, they do not have to stay in a hotel. They actually live out in Long Island. So no one's in this place. They have maids that come in there and clean the place. So we need to make sure that if someone's gonna clean this, they're not gonna go tramping through there and destroy everything. I mean, with natural and artificial grasses, it's difficult. I, I said to them, there's gonna be some loss, but at least we can do is make sure that the structure and everything, everything is in is gonna be very, very, very stable. So the, the ground itself there is actually polygem epoxy, which is amazing material. We dyed it, made sure it was integral colored, and then we actually threw bits of leaf litter in there, bits of broken grass and mixed it in there and started laying down and everything's glued into that. Actually, it, uh, it's so strong, the taxidermist came in and needed to put animals in here and um, called me up and said, he said that stuff is the most adorable stuff. They could not chisel it out. They wanted to make holes to put the animal's feet into and they could not remove it. He said, we're hitting it with a drill. He said, we're hitting it with a hammer drill. He said, we're literally smacking it with a chisel and a hammer. He said, we cannot break it. Once you mix sand and everything into polygem, it is one of the strongest materials I've ever seen. Polygem? Polygem. Polygem epoxy. Check them out. They're, I think, out of the Chicago area. Incredible company, incredible products. And it, it basically did what he wanted. It was a nice little environment. They came down. They were very easy going clients. They, they loved what we did. And it was nice to have the free range. These are some of the things that we love to do because there's no scientist breathing down our neck. There's no botanist saying that this plant has to look like this. It has to be in bloom. We're able to just have some fun. And these are, these are great. And I tell you what, as, <clears throat> as designers, these could be very, very lucrative because these clients will spend ridiculous amounts of money for, for things like this. And all you have to do is tell them it's available. That's one of the biggest things that we see that is not happening is that you need to tell these clients what's possible. But unfortunately, a lot of designers don't even know that this is going on. I mean, this is, this is coming out of the theming industry, coming out of from the exhibit building industry, and now more architects and landscape designers are looking to these areas to say, hey, we need to push the envelope a little bit more. We need to find a different way. The clients, it's, I mean, sadly, it's all about the ego. You know, it's all about outdoing the neighbor, outdoing their friends. Look, they have this place to have dinner parties. They need to impress people. So they're looking sometimes to you to say, hey, what could we possibly do? So I think it's, it's time to really get, you know, you can get a little crazy and really push the envelope with these things. <laughs> So the inside of the pond, what we wanted to do is, is make this, um, we were having budget issues. They didn't want to go for the polygen. Polygen is expensive. And for the inside of the pond, honestly, it's not necessary. So what we did is we used concrete. We actually dyed the concrete. We mixed plant material into the concrete to give it a very chopped up organic look. Started laying in the stones, laying in the artificial plants. And it just, it, it looked very, very good. Concrete's a great material to work with as well. And that was the, uh, the finished area before the animals were actually put into it. You know, a little, little overview once there. There's the alligator in there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Just, uh, just wild. And by the time we went to finish this, they even had the, the room furnished. So now not only are we walking through a finished house, now we're walking around furniture, rugs, everything. It was just an amazing challenge, but a lot of fun. So the details, basically those landforms I showed you, I just wanted to give you an idea of what we can do with details. I just got two quick slides in here. These are just some close-ups of some of our environments. We really try to go all out with making sure that the details are there. To us, we're seeing more and more clients want to see those little details. Someone walks into their home, they're having a dinner party, you know, they're looking at this thing and, you know, it's got to have some interest. You know, little frogs here and there. That exhibit, actually, we wound up putting a number of uh, preserved insects in there. They loved it. We had, we had butterflies in there, beetles. It was, it was fantastic. The details are important. The details, this is a, just a close-up of, uh, of our seashore environments. 
you know, if you get down, look up close, you can see all kinds of things that are interesting to the viewer. And it's, it's very important. And I think it sets the work apart because there's a lot of companies starting to get into this and you see where they fall short sometimes. And, um, and the clients see that. So trees, trees are a huge business. Artificial trees are, are just absolutely ridiculous. And we'll get into that. This could be a, an entire lecture in itself. So we make artificial trees several different ways. Um, sometimes we use parts of real trees. We've actually taken the bark off of real specimens and actually pieced it back together over structures. A lot of the trees in the Museum of Natural History are done that way through the Hall of Forestry. A lot of those were collected in the field. They would take the bark off of the specimens, number it, and then put it back over a wire and wood armature. Um, we always try to look for different materials, th things that are going to work fast for us, things that are going to be inexpensive for the clients. So one of the things we do is we use a lot of PVC. Um, this, is a, this is the daisy tree. This was the, um, the daisy tree that was part of the Darwin exhibit. Daisy trees grow, grow in the Galapagos. They are a very distinct looking tree and they were hounding us because no one has made a model that they were satisfied with. So we started this as a PVC armature. That's, uh, that's PVC trunk, PVC branches. The, we just start using smaller and smaller diameters of PVC as we go. We fiberglass the joints together, we heat it, we bend it, um, and the PVC goes out to the end. Now, for the smaller branches, we actually used wrapped wire. We kept spinning wire until we got the diameters we wanted, and then fused it into the ends and started, uh, started tapering down to those smaller branches. So the smaller branches you see are wire. The bark texture on the tree is, again, polygem epoxy, stamped. With, uh, with texture molds. The material on the wire, um, because polygem is not that flexible, we, uh, the, the, the one we use anyway, um, there's a, a lot of flex in the branches. And again, traveling exhibits, going in a truck, uncrated, crated. So we need a little bit of flexibility in the, uh, in the smaller branches. And those are actually coated with um, liquid nails. We took liquid nails, when it dries, the solvent-based liquid nails is extremely flexible. We took liquid nails mixed with peat moss to give it some texture, dry pigments, and coated the small branches or wires with, uh, with this, uh, this concoction. Worked out unbelievably. Unbelievably. Just fantastic. Even the botanist was happy. <laughs> For this particular piece, a lot of the trees that you'll see in the commercial industry and private homes are leaves that are purchased from commercial silk vendors. Um, again, since this was supposed to be a scientific model, we had to actually sculpt uh, a master of the leaf and vacuum form the leaves, which is a very interesting procedure in itself. Um, once we started cutting the leaves out, um, Again, because it was a, a traveling exhibit, we need to make them durable. The buds on the tree, the little flowers, um, needed to be sculpted because there was nothing available that was close to them. Uh, so these were sculpted out of epoxy. We made silicone molds and then poured what seemed like 50,000 of them. The leaves were primed with automotive paint. We had to find something that was going to be durable and withstand the travel. Um, so automotive paints were the best for, uh, for just adhering to this material. The leaves were detailed, and as you can see, a little pile of the dead leaves. Dead leaves were my favorite of this entire tree. Daisy trees have a very specific dead leaf that hangs straight down, and we could not figure out how the heck we're going to make these dead leaves. You try heating the vacuum form material, it melts, it goos all the textures out of it. So we actually started playing around with liquid latex and brushing it onto the vacuum form leaf. So the vacuum form leaf acted as a mold. The liquid latex would dry on there, we'd pigment it, we'd color it, and when you peeled it off, it looked exactly like a dead leaf. You were able to push it together, it would stick to itself a little bit, and it made just the most perfect dead leaves I've ever seen. If you wanted to order a retail daisy tree at your store, what would you, what's the rough price? Uh, this, uh, this model, I think we, um, Jeez, we didn't charge enough for that. <laughs> I believe we charged sixteen thousand for that for that daisy tree. Um, the leaves itself, once we had the wire stems, of course, uh, glued onto the vacuum form leaves. We then braised 
all the leaves together. Again, durability was very important. We, we wouldn't trust the epoxy or just gluing these or taping them together. So we actually brazed all of the leaves onto a piece of wire that was then uh, epoxied and uh, some of them were epoxied, some of them were brazed onto the branches that we made. They were all splayed open, arranged, and, and detailed before they, before they went on. And that's the finished tree. It's nice. It had some, some lichens on the bark, which were nice. Those are painted on there. Um, some nice little mosses hanging down and everything. The, uh, it, just, it was just a really cool piece to do. And thank you. Thank you. It was, it was fun. So this is, a, this is a tree for a private client. Um, that's, um, that's a peacock that we actually mounted for them. Peacocks are hot. We either, I'll tell you, the most peacocks we did were actually for Polo Ralph Lauren for their window displays. It's amazing. Um, so we want to do this peacock to have an area where the tree is going. It's fitting into a specific area, so the, the broken ends of the tree have to fit up against the wall. Again, PVC was great for this. Uh, Polygem epoxy bark. Stamp and textured. You're able to make just about anything. As you can see, it's kind of like a little buttress root tree. Picture of it without the peacock. Some vines coming down. The vines are made of rope and string that are covered with that, uh, that liquid nails. Uh, it just worked out very good because if you hit them, they're very flexible. Uh, the lichens on this were made out of latex, another process that we just developed. And the other thing we had to take into consideration is how do we get this through a doorway? So the joints um, are made using PVC. We do them all different ways. So for this, we just decided to use PVC into PVC. And there's a little oh. section there. We make, the, uh, we make the seams very jagged because one of the things that drives me crazy is you see people build artificial trees and this giant joint and seam right around this thing, which looks horrible. Um, so one of the things we try to do is really build a nice seam. So when this goes together, it's virtually seamless. Um, this is a tree for a wall. This is going to be a wall-mounted piece. And this, again, is PVC, polygem epoxy. And just an idea of the different uh, bark styles. I mean, you can really, I mean, the possibilities are endless with this. I, I hate to keep stressing that, but it really is the remarkable uh, thing of it is it's endless. Again, this is the uh, small PVC branches with the wire, uh, wire branch ends. Broken ends are really hot. You can really sculpt some wild textures on broken ends. How long does it take to um, produce something like this? This piece right here was about about a week. That wasn't bad. If you're you know if you're feeling good and you're working and there's no problems and uh, something like this can be can be done fairly fairly quickly depending on the species and things Wait, like one that. person or several people. Usually two guys. Mm -hmm. And a private client which says, I think I need a tree limb hanging on my wall. Mm -hmm. kind of, what is, what is Usually it's, it's for a, a sportsman that wants an animal laying on it yeah. for something like that. <laughs> but here's the thing. You know, if a designer would, would you know, come to a client and say, hey, you know, you want a, a cool way to hang this chandelier? You know, have this tree coming out of the wall. You know, instead of all the, you know, the rigging and everything to put this thing up, have a tree come on a wall. The possibilities are endless for this. Like I said, we started doing these railings and it's just become so popular because the, the nice thing about these trees now, it's a very useful and artistic way to hide structures in a room. You know, you have support columns in the room, the client doesn't want to see, you got to get rid of them, you know, build a tree. Uh, there's so many possibilities. <laughs> yep. Does anybody, everybody know what a sauna tube is? Of course, yes. Very popular, great for making trees. It's, it's, they're very inexpensive, they're easy to work with. Um, we cut them up, you can bend them. Um, we fiberglass them together, they take fiberglass very well. Um, we've made a ton of trees out of, of sauna tubes, they're fantastic. Um, this is, this is a recent tree we did. This is, this is one sauna tube, cut and bent a little bit. The base of the tree is actually urethane foam. We foam in the base where the, where the sauna tube is. And then out of the end of the sauna tube, we basically pour urethane foam in there, fill it, and then we cut the sauna tube away from that portion so we can sculpt the broken end out of urethane foam and then cover it with, with epoxy. That's the tree before paint. Little detail of the broken end. 
The urethane foam, we use about a four pound density foam, so it really works well for carving. Mushrooms, we have an inventory of mushroom molds, well, bracket fungus, <laughs> bar texture molds. Uh, again, those are, those are small PVC branches coming out of there. And that's the piece. That was a black bear, salmon underneath, the rocks underneath. Are the, does everybody know what Bondo is? Bondo is auto body filler. It's automotive repair putty, what they use for filling in dents. Great material. It's basically polyester resin with fillers in it. So we use a ton of that material for making rocks. It's great. We have tons of latex rock molds, and we do just a slush coat of Bondo inside there, and all those rocks are Bondo. It paints very well. They're light. They're durable. And a little detail of the painted end and some of the details. These are all commercially available silk plants that we cut up, altered, repainted. Um, you could do some really great things with that once you alter artificials. This is another sonotube. This is a, uh, a really dried, weathered, cracked tree. This is, this is really nice. It's a beautiful piece. Um, just showing what you can do. This is a lot of hand sculpting. Because there's not a lot of molds you can make for dead wood texture, most of this has, has to be done by hand. These are another one of my favorites. I mean, to make dead wood is amazing to think that it's all epoxy. The clients are always blown away by that. Steel armature trees are very popular. That's the way a lot of companies build these big trees, um, which is basically steel pipe, um, rebar, pencil rod, and the beauty of it, there's no science to making this. There's no, there's no set plan for making these armatures. So, you know, the area, it's wide open to the, to the artist to use whatever's gonna work best and suit the, uh, the purpose. This was for the American Museum of Natural History's uh, Extreme Mammals exhibit. We had to restore these primates. These primates are all over 100 years old. They're soft bodies, meaning that the, the armatures inside are actually raptic cells here, meaning that they flex. And when they flex, they crack. So we needed to make new branches for these to serve two purposes. One, they gave them to us without branches. Two, they needed to support the specimens. This is a traveling exhibit, created, uncreated, and just going to be beat to death. So we had to figure out a way to make these, uh, uh, these, uh, these primates survive. So we fabricated steel armatures, uh, and we were actually able to weld the primates right to the armature. We spot welded them right to there, yeah. That's, that was, uh, there's a little bit of wire. The taxidermist used a wire armature, of course. There's a little bit of wire coming out of the foot of each primate. And we actually were able to get in there and spot weld uh, that right onto the steel pipe without sending a primate into flames. <laughs> Which is a miracle in itself. A little koala. And again, as you can see, you know, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to the armature. I mean, it's a structure. There's no set plans for it. You can, there's a lot of freedom in this. Um, over the steel armature, what we did is we, we poured some urethane foam uh, just to give us a little body to start sculpting over. And then again, polygem epoxy over the top, hand sculpted, a little stamping. And there's a little shot of the finished texture. Again, because it's a museum piece, it had to be nondescript. They could not be able to, they didn't want to be able to tell if it was an oak tree. So it, it had to be so, most of it was uh, modeled as dead wood. So it was just uh, unidentifiable. Do the people who do the wood specialize in that? Do the people who do the animals, or just everybody in? You know, we're very fortunate. The staff I have can do everything. And that's a big statement because you're right, most of the companies out there have tree specialists, have rock specialists. We just happen to be really fortunate. I mean, there are, there are guys that do things better than others. We do have guys that are kind of specialized, but I, uh, most of our guys can do the rock work, the tree work, and that's a hard thing to find because you don't just put a post up on Craigslist looking for a tree maker. Uh, um, it takes a good sculptor, but what we found to do because if you start to look at this stuff on the internet, you'll see great trees and you'll see horrible trees. Any, anyone could start sculpting a tree if you're a sculptor, but do you know trees? I, I found this fascinating even with me as I start a piece. Do you really know what a tree looks like? How a tree grows? How the branches come out? 
I mean, it's, it's not what you think. Just like you, you take a, a, a sculptor and you tell them to sculpt a rock. Do you really know what a rock looks like? The way it cracks, the way the, you know, the, way the textures are on it, it's, it's a lot more difficult than, than most people realize. So it always makes it difficult for us to find uh, good guys that can do this type of work. Are they artists also? They are artists, yes. Mm -hmm. how, how do you recruit them? Um, most of our guys come from word of mouth. Okay. Friends of ours that they're freelance, some guys are freelance work that'll just travel around or come to us whenever we need an extra hand. They like it that way. Um, some of the, a lot of the guys that work for me are guys that were friends of mine that got out of their own businesses for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, this was a, uh, a root ball. We had a client that wanted, he had a brown bear that we were mounting for him and wanted the bear leaning on this giant root ball. So, okay, where do we go from here? All right, so basically, he didn't want to sketch, he didn't care about the design, he said, just build me a root ball. I'm like, no problem. So, you know, one of our artists, Mike there, got together, he put a sonnet tube up, started bending some rebar, and uh, once the rebar was bent into the, the rough shape of the arms, it's covered with chicken wire. Again, urethane foam was blown all over that. He started carving it and then sculpting it in, uh, in poly gem. And just to give you a little shot of the armature again there, there's the finished root ball. This is a mix of artificial and real. 99.9% of that is all artificial. The small, tiny roots you see there poking out are real roots. We didn't want to go crazy and start fabricating these small, tiny roots, so we decided to use real ones. Textures were great. He did the broken end in there. It was hollowed out. Just really beautiful piece. The environment went in. So one of the things we needed to, uh, needed to do, client comes to us and said, I need to put this on the second floor. We got to carry this over a staircase and down a hallway. He said, we need it to come apart. So we have to figure out again, how do we make this come apart? What are the joints gonna look like? Where are the joints gonna be? How is it gonna come apart easy enough to where the average homeowner could put this thing back together again? So what we did is before the armature was, uh, was epoxied, we, we cut a joint in there, put some steel uh, square stock so it would fit together very tight. And, uh, and as it was sculpted, it was constantly lifted up and put back down, lifted up, put back down. So the sculpture meshed together very tight so you did not see the joints. And what you're looking there is at a joint right across that thing there. That's where that... You have, to make you have to make suitcases for these things? Um, thankfully, most of our work is either picked up or created by a separate company. Uh, I hate to create items. Um, so we actually hire uh, a friend of mine owns a company that does that. So if we need to pack it up, we usually hire them to come and do it. Are they art shippers or what do they do? They are. They're art shippers. Yeah. But that was a, uh, that was fun. The client was very pleased and as you can see that goes back together very well. <laughs> Again, we found that these, uh, these jagged seams are just perfect because otherwise you'd never be able to hide that. It's, it's always going to be visible. Yeah. So water, we'll, we'll touch on really quick, we'll go through this, but water surfaces are, are a lot of fun and they're you see again a, a huge variation in the quality of them. So to do water surfaces they're done several different ways. The most accurate way to do them is to sculpt them. So this is a, uh, this is a piece we did for a client and um, we've done several water surfaces, but this, is, this we have pretty well photo documented. Um, quick overview, we lay down a base of clay, figure out what kind of water surface we're doing, start sculpting in the details. I mean, it's sculpted water. Again, a very difficult thing. Try to figure out what water looks like. Stare at it long enough and try to figure out where the waves are, where the peaks are, the secondary waves. It's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. Oh, I think it's stalled. Oh. Is that little front wheel spinning? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, yep. Fast forward. So, the small little ripples and everything, all the details are, are sculpted into this smoothed out the best we can, and we do a silicone mold. 
This is actually, again, <clears throat> for a private client, we gotta do this quick. We have to do this as economical as we can because the client doesn't wanna pay $40,000 for a water surface. So even the silicone mold, silicone caulk out of the tube, fantastic mold making material. If you're doing something quick, we may never make another one of these again. GE silicone, 100% silicone out of the tube works fantastic for making a quick mold like this. Um, the, uh, the resin itself is, um, is uh, surfboard resin that we pigmented. Surfboard resin is very clear, special mat to go into it, great water surface. There's the piece we pulled out of there, on top of there. Because there's nothing underneath this, we had to figure out, all right, great, we make a clear water surface. What is the guy going to see the plywood underneath the base? We're not going to sculpt the pond scene because the bottom of the pond is not going to be two inches from the surface of the water. So what we did is we put a mirror underneath there. The mirror gave a beautiful effect. It just reflected the light back and worked out perfectly. And that's the finished water. A close up of it. Plants were inserted in there, which was really nice. So we actually drilled holes in there and actually glued some, some little just pieces of grass so it looked like the, uh, the water was just creeping into the, into the land a little bit. <clears throat> That's the finish. The finished habitat. The, uh, the buffalo are not done yet. <laughs> yeah. It was the buffalo uh, with, with the animal. <laughs> no, no. It's a, it's a pedestal piece. We had uh, one of our high-end clients went to Africa on safari, wanted, uh, he, he took two Cape buffalo and wanted something ridiculous with them. I said, okay, so what are we going to do? So he said, I'd like him on a pedestal because he wants to put it in a room that he can walk completely around. So I said, well, how about we suspend them both by the female's mouth? And we did a quick sketch and he loved it. So those, the two were just suspended by a piece of steel that's coming out of her mouth. There's actually a pretty elaborate steel system, I shouldn't say simple, but it's, uh, there's a steel receiver in the, in the wood base that comes out into her mouth, up her neck, out her shoulder, into his shoulder, and the entire piece breaks down. The, uh, we actually used a clear silicone around her mouth because the water, if you looked at it closely, actually goes into her nostrils a little bit to complete the seam so it doesn't look like this <clears throat> statue of a buffalo shoved into this uh, plexiglass water. We don't want to have that look. So it's actually flexible at that point and actually rips the uh, ripples and goes right around her mouth. So there's no, there's no, the rest of the buffalo is not part of this? No, no, these are two. This is another way of displaying shoulder mounts. Instead of doing the head on the wall, they wanted something a little different. So what, what's visible on the other side? Do you see the side of the skin? On the back side is just finished off. We actually just texture it with epoxy or a lot of times we'll put a piece of leather back there and finish it off. It's, it's just sculpted to be uh, just a little artistic rather than just a flat back where it would normally go up against the wall. But the other side of the piece, I mean, is, is just, is, it's three dimensional. You can walk around it, it's, you know. And I, I just wanted to put a couple things of some models and sculpture in here. We do a lot of model making. This is something, I added this in because I think this is an area that's really untouched with designers architects, and even landscape designers. There are so many things you can make to add into someone's pool area, someone's themed room. The possibilities are endless. Whereas for years after we did this Galapagos exhibit, I mean, I could just picture, you know, a, a little section of a room that has these, these volcanic rock formations with a few of these, uh, these are Sally Lightfoot crabs on there. There's so many possibilities with this. I mean, they're beautiful accent pieces. So I think there's an untapped market uh, for, for pieces like this. It just, uh, you know, it just comes down to using it. Blue-footed booby. We make a lot of these models. These are actually sculpted, cast, and then, uh, and then poured into either uh, in urethane, fiberglass. We can make them structurally sound. We can make them uh, durable enough to be outside, in pool rooms, saunas. The possibilities, again, are endless. This was a rhinoceros we did. We did a, had a client that wanted a rhinoceros shoulder mount on a wall. So this is a foam armature sculpted in epoxy, and there's the finished product. Vampire bat we did. That's for a museum up in Massachusetts. Again, that's a complete fabrication. And the duckling. This is, this is where, just when you think you, you've heard everything, one of our landscape architects calls me. He said, we have a very good client we do a lot of work for. She has a bronze pair of ducks on her front porch. 
She now has grandchildren and wants bronze ducklings next to the bronze sculpture. He said, we can't find anything. She's looked all over the internet. Can you make us a set of ducklings? I said, all right, well, you know, she don't want to go for real bronze, we'll do them cold cast. So we did a sketch, sculpted them out, and voila, she's got ducklings for the front porch. It's, it's just amazing where these clients come from, what they ask for. It's just absolutely endless. We did, we did actually two different types for her so she could have a little variation. And now these are on her front porch. She actually ordered six of these. How much would it cost to order a crab? The crab, you know, I never worked out a price on the crab. I have to go back and see. The crabs, um, the crabs are, are, are beautiful. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to actually work it out. You can call me and I'll, I'll give you an estimate I mean, on it. Like four hundred dollars or three thousand dollars? No, no. You're probably a couple hundred dollars, maybe like seven hundred dollars, something like that. See, what's interesting, and again, which is great for architects and designers, we're doing these museum exhibits. We're getting the jobs to to fabricate these crazy models. Now, a lot of these things we make molds for. Now we have these molds sitting on our shelves. What do you do with them? They may never order another one again. But you could benefit from that. You call us up. Now if you need to tell you like for crabs, I have molds for them. So you're also uh, avoiding um, the harsh charges of the sculpting, the molding casting. Um, you know, you're, you're at a great advantage now that we've amassed this inventory of molds. So it's, it's just something to think about. So that's the, uh, that's the end. There's our, our contact information if, if you need anything and just want to give us a lot of questions. Um, yeah, I can give you my I can give you my email address if you have some way to write it down. Yeah. It's W P Studio at optonline.net. If you guys got questions, you know, yeah, thanks. no problem. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely awesome. awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, hope it, I hope it opened your eyes a little bit, open your imagination. I mean, there's so many things that can be done. Um, if you're working in this field, um, there's, there's a lot of things you can do to, to, bring, to bring different things to your clients. So if you guys have any questions, just I, far away. I, I know I do. Right? If, um, so I'd love to, <laughs> sure, to sure. just kind of jump in. I mean, I mean if, I, a couple questions are. Um, as far as you know, the exhibition practices and the types of things, and also the big renovation project that you're doing yes. now, um, are you noticing either new trends in ex expedition expectations that, or exhibition expectations that people want to see, where you're suddenly being called upon to do a lot of particular types of landscapes or displays that you wouldn't have been doing ten years ago? And do you, uh, extending from that, do you see something in ten years where there's going to be a, a new type of a display that you'll be called upon to be doing, and can you anticipate that? Well, I think uh, working at the American Museum, we've seen several things. We've seen there's always those heritage halls with those great dioramas. Mm -hmm. People always flock to those. Everyone remembers it as a child. You love going to those dioramas. Um, and for the last several years, the traveling exhibits have been very profitable for them. So they're building these new exhibits. A lot of interactives, a um, lot of uh, there's a big demand to do things quicker, cheaper, faster. Um, just get them out the door, get them on the road, and it's starting to backfire a little bit because the quality starts to drop when they start to do that. So now I think they're starting to look back to the dioramas again and want to do things uh, a little bit more old school, a little bit quality, um, but y you don't know because it's all up to the, the designer that's in charge of the project because we see that all the time. We see one designer that loves old school dioramas and wants to build things based on that, wants the quality, wants the scientific accuracy. And you will work with a new designer that says, we need buttons to push, we need things to scream and lights and you know, it's just, it really depends on who you're working with. So right now I think it's, it's bouncing back and forth. But I think it'll go back to the, the old school way because I just, I've seen the visitors where they go through some of these exhibits and what they stare at, yeah. what brings them back, and some things that they just, they just run through yeah. and don't even pay attention to. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing the renovation work, do you find, or have you found that you either discover something that is, is incredibly unexpected but actually gives you insight into how to build something in the future? Yes. And, and what's the, an example? Those dioramas are amazing. If you go through the American Museum, the, the whole of North American Mammals, the Akeley Hall, 
those dioramas are just incredibly designed. They are they're artistic. They're beautiful. They're actual locations. And the amazing thing about them is that the tricks that had to be done to make these work are just incredible. The lighting, for example, um, you know, the, the lighting is set in such a way that you know if there's no shadows being cast in there. Um, some of those exhibits, if you look in the Akeley Hall, uh, the lights don't cast the correct shadows in there. So there's one actually exhibit in there where the artist went into the foreground and had to paint out the shadows and paint in new ones wow. where the sun would actually cast the correct shadow. So things like that that no one gets to see. I highly recommend Steve Quinn wrote a book, Windows on Nature, fantastic. And it'll give you a little bit of insight to little tricks like that. Um, the wolf exhibit, the timber wolves, if you look at them, that snow. The, the lighting in the diorama is too weak to cast any shadows. So the snow it was actually marble dust and the shadows underneath the wolves were actually uh, powdered pigments just drizzled in there. Even the saplings, it, it's powdered pigment in there because the lights don't cast any shadows. Um, things painted white so they don't cast a shadow on the, the paintings. I mean, there's, a, there's an amazing amount of little things like that. Yeah, yeah it's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as innovations and stuff, um, uh, go. Where, where do you find that these come from, it, both materially and technically? You mentioned the auto industry a lot, like auto putty mm -hmm. and that sure. kind of stuff. Sure. I, I think it comes from so many different uh, industries because there's no handbooks written. I don't think there's even a class available on exhibit building. I mean, some of the companies start to do like little hands-on classes, things like that. But uh, where do you find information? Google how to build a daisy tree. <laughs> and you, you know, where do you start? Where do you begin? So we looked everywhere. We looked to metal workers for making, making armatures. We looked to mount makers for building supports. We worked with engineers on how to engineer the thing coming apart. Um, it, it's, I mean, we've used inspirations from fly tires all the way up to, in, to engineers. So I think in order to be successful, you have to be open-minded and take it from everywhere. Um, I, I just have two more questions, and then I'm going to open it up to everybody. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to monopolize this. I'm just fascinated. Um, uh, and, and saying that, I just forgot one of them. But um, uh, uh, as far as uh, the research expeditions that you mentioned on mm -hmm. your website, mm -hmm. uh, it's sure. really interesting that you actually, you know, you have your guys go out into sure. and work on sure. five continents, kind of doing yeah. you know, research. Yeah. Can you tell us about those? Our, our guys are, are maniacs for this type of work. We, we live it. This is who we are. Um, we, so in our spare time, we're out doing research. Um, we're collecting stuff constantly. If I'm going on vacation, I'm collecting plants, if I can, um, taking photos. So our guys have traveled, and they're just um, not so much on, on specific expeditions for a museum or anything like that, but just funded by themselves, gone out for clients, and just collected material and done research. The field research is extremely important. And Steve Quinn told this to me years ago, he said, you know, you can have a great artist come in and open a book and try to sculpt a plant or a model, but unless they have a naturalist eye and field experience, it's, it's lost, you, you can't do it. If you're, I mean, you can take the best sculptor in the world and say, you know, sculpt and paint me a yellowfin tuna, but unless you've actually caught a yellowfin tuna and held one in your hands, it's, the experience is priceless because, and that, that's something that's lost today. We're so disconnected from nature that, um, like I said, a lot of us, uh, you know, you don't really know what a tree looks like. You know, if, if you were to, if you were to cast and, uh, or, or sculpt a redwood, you know, do you really know what a redwood looks like? You know, you could look at all the photos online that you want, but unless you've actually been there and seen them and been up close to them and see the different variations in the bark and, and what grows on them, it's, um, there's no substitute for field work. I'm a firm believer in it. That's where I tend to be very old school, because that's what these old masters, those dioramas were built by guys that, that were just, if field work was everything to them. And that's what made them so good, because they were not only ta taxidermists, but they were, na they were naturalists, they were artists, they were inventors. You know, if you read about Akeley, I mean, he's just the epitome of that. It's just incredible. So do your field work. If you want to do stuff like that, educate yourself in the natural field as much as you can because it's very important and there's no substitute for it. And you can see that in people's work. We see it all the time. I can look at a tree a guy sculpted and know this guy never seen this tree or doesn't even know how a tree grows. You see these arms coming out of it, these crazy ways. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. You know? 
Um, well, the last question I, I, I want to ask before throwing it open, what it goes back to something you said towards the beginning, which was that um, you sort of pepper throughout the display uh, mm -hmm. grasses that won't be recognizable by mm -hmm. a botanist. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating that you would actually deliberately make a landscape that can't be recognized by a specialist in that field. Sure. I'm just not only exactly what it is that you get by doing that, but also does that apply even to the rock features where you would make a mountain that's unrecognizable to geologists, or, or is it so well, a different criteria? It's really the call of the client. Yeah. Um, the client, if we're doing work for a museum and they need something that um, they, if we're putting rock work in there and it's not an exhibit for that type of rock, they want it to be nondescript. Okay. Can't, they don't. They don't want to see, you know, a, a bad representation of, of basalt. I mean, so it really depends on the client. Uh, it, it's up to them. For if you came to me and said I wanted a, a slide coming down in my pool, um, we'll ask you. Do you want granite? You know, do you want sandstone? What do you want? But um, you know, you have the option to say, I just want rock. You know, I just want something that looks cool. So it, it's really it, it varies. It depends on the client. So, yeah, if, if anybody has questions, uh, yes? I have a question. Um, yeah, I'm really fascinated by your personal thanks for coming. Oh, my um, pleasure. Okay. Um, I'm fascinated by just your use of the terms artificial and natural, and it's kind of how, uh, and you've given a really good description of how your uh, relationships with naturalists played into your work creating these artificial parts. Is there any way that your creation of these environments that changes your perception of like nature itself. So when you're out kind of like looking at trees, do you think of a way that you could make it, you know what I mean? I, I do. Uh, I, I, I do that almost to a, to a point that's a flaw. Um, Yes, it's doing this type of work really makes me appreciate our natural world. It has made me a uh, more active conservationist because, you know, to, when you, whenever you do a piece like this, you're involved with it intimately. You know, I mean, we recently did this project where we, we had to recreate a thylacine, which was the Tasmanian wolf that went extinct back in the 1930s, I think it was. And just doing the research, and, and it just made me so sad to think that we could allow something like this to go extinct, that this can happen. And it's still happening today. So it's, it's kind of bittersweet for me because I still collect specimens. I deal with the sporting community. Um, but there's, they get a bad rap also. But me, uh, personally, I, um, it makes me more, uh, more aware of my surroundings. And just, it, it, it makes, me, uh, makes me think that we really need to preserve this. Um, so if we're gonna collect specimens out of the wild, um, we need to do it responsibly, even with plants. Even with plants. If there's a way that we can take the plants that, uh, that we can leave the roots behind so you're not destroying the plants in that area, um, things like that. Yeah, whenever, whatever we build, whether it's a model of a plant or an entire diorama, you, you form a relationship with that. Mm -hmm. Is there some thing that is like the, the thing that no one has done yet? I mean, is, it, is there an animal or some fur or some aspect of a living thing that I don't know. I mean, we've been we've been really fortunate to work on some projects um, where they were significant in similar situations like that. Where we did this dodo recreation, we were contracted by another studio to do a sculpture of a dodo because they had just found this huge cache of, of dodo bones. They wanted to build a model that was more accurate than anything that's been built before. All dodos were thought to have been this very robust looking bird that you see on the internet when you Google them. And the scientists now find out that this bird looked nothing like that. So there was no models that represented the dodo from the research that we, we have today. So we, we did this and we, uh, they deemed it the most accurate dodo in the world. No one before has <laughs> been able to, you know, Pretty interesting thing to be doing. Why not? Why not? We, we were proud of it. But yeah, we had several <laughs> we had several dodo specialists That's that right. weighed in on this and kept telling us where we needed to move it, what we needed it to look like, the feather texture, because uh, it was a cross between a rail and a pigeon. So we needed to create this accurate fit. They told us sculpt the feather that that's a cross between a rail and a pigeon. I'm like, all right. So we sit down, we try to figure out what the hell a rail and a pigeon feather would look like if it was morphed together. 
So we did samples, had them look at it, and they said, well, we think this is as accurate as it can be. And that's it. So situations like that, yes. What yes. about the, the, the other weird animals in this situation are people who are your clients? Are, yes. Are, are you sometimes just nonplussed by the people you meet and the things that they want you to make? I get such a kick out of it. Like I said, I think I got the greatest job in the world because you just, I mean, I could tell you so many stories about the clients I've met, the situations we've been in. It's, I, I don't even know where to begin. I really don't. I love that. To me, you know, if, if I'm in a restaurant, it, well, you know, if I meet somebody on the street that seems to be like a lunatic, I'm the first one that wants to walk up to them and find out what makes them tick. So this business is perfect for me. Um, oh, geez, I don't even know where to begin with the stories. Um, just crazy situations, like clients asking for the most ridiculous thing. Rock formations in their living room. You know, uh, you know, things that light up, trees coming out of the wall. We actually, one of my friends actually, is just finishing up a project um, in a home in northern New Jersey, and the guy has um, a swimming pool in the lower level of the home, and he wanted a tree house built in the top floor. But he wanted the tree house in the tree. And he wanted the tree to go through every level of the house. So my friend went in there and they built it, they did a steel armature of the tree uh, in one floor onto the next floor and did it, they sprayed it with shotcrete, they did it in concrete and then polygem epoxy. And then there's this very elaborate tree house that's beautiful. I mean, it's not a rickety tree house. I mean, this is. Um, this is an elaborate tree house. Yeah, in a house? In a house. In a house. Well, it's kind of open, so I don't know if it would be a tree house. It's more of like a tree deck, I guess. So, um, and, um, and that project. And why do you just, why do you want to You know, we always wonder what makes a client tick and ask for these things. We really don't know. The client, it was a big job. It was a, it, that tree was a, it's a $300,000 tree. You know, and the client just had to have it. You know, they get an idea. The nice thing about our business is we're bringing dreams to reality. Um, you know, basically, a client will say, I have all the money in the world. You know, what else could you possibly do? So you put a tree in your living room. You know, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> yes. How do you estimate? Um, I mean, it must be difficult to estimate. It is. It is. Um, luckily, I come from a family of contractors. So uh, I was schooled very early on how to estimate like a construction job. And it's really just experience. Because the first thing my father taught me was there's no way to learn how to estimate anything. It's just based on experience. So we do it just like a construction job. If we're going to do a tree, for example, we figure out, all right, the tree needs to be this tall. We're going to use you know, X amount of steel, X amount of epoxy, X amount of man hours. And it just comes from experience knowing how fast our guys can sculpt a tree how fast we can do the steel work, how fast we can, uh, we can finish and paint it. That's just the experience. Sometimes we're right on, sometimes we're way off. You know? So back to your question, what's the thing that hasn't been done yet? Make a fortune in this business <laughs> because, of, because of jobs like that. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing, it really is, it really is. There was a, a documentary that came out a couple years ago about, um, if I remember right, it was about the, uh, tr the trading floor in Chicago. And um, one of the guys that used to be a trader, uh, he made a whole bunch of money and I guess retired, but he's a big, big game hunter in Africa. And w one of his dreams was to get a, a giraffe head mounted onto a uh, wheeled cart. So he can actually wheel the entire giraffe <laughs> with, with the neck. It's about 10 feet tall. He can wheel it around his house. And uh, anyway, so wow. that's, uh, that's an example of a slightly strange client request that I have to imagine. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I, and it's nothing new. If you look at taxidermy, for example, if you look through some of the old books on the history of taxidermy, uh, you know, it's gone through these stages um, where um, they were starting to build furniture out of animals. Um, they were starting to take, you know, uh, I think there's actual picture in the book, uh, uh, the name of the author just escapes me at the moment, but there was a picture of a giraffe head and shoulders that came down and at the base of the shoulders was sculpted into an armchair. And a very elaborate armchair. It was very Victorian. It was plush, red velvet. I mean, gorgeous. So, um, you know, I guess people have asked for crazy things throughout history, and it's just, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's our job to fulfill that. I guess. Is there a competitive? Like, suppose suppose instead of choosing terrestrial natural animals that exist in nature, suppose mm -hmm. I wanted to make a Martian animal or a 
Oh, sure, 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 absolutely. Then you do that too? Absolutely, I had a guy, a guy walked in, I'm sitting at my desk the other day, guy walked in off the street, and, uh, and I, I never know where that's gonna lead me. And, <laughs> um, he, said, uh, he said, I own three bars in town. He said, I love collecting crazy stuff. He said, I want something cool to hang in the bar. I'm like, what do you want? You know, he said, I just want something crazy. So I, we brought him through, and there's everything going on in our shop, from trees to rocks to animals. And he said, I don't know. He said, I just want something bizarre. It doesn't have to be like an animal. And he said, it, it could be something, you know, like a made-up animal, something, uh, something sci-fi, maybe something, uh, you know, just something weird and ridiculous. He said, I want to hang it from the ceiling. He said, just design something and give me an estimate. Okay, so sometimes that's the hardest job because what the hell could you possibly come up with with this guy wants to hang in his bar? So yeah, I mean, we. but then again, that could be a lot of fun because I could literally let my imagination run wild, sketch something out and, and sell a great art piece. To me, see, that's what's fun to me is that if I probably had to make a living by just making tree every day, I couldn't do it, there's no way. That's why I love where our business is at right now because we literally don't know what's gonna happen next week. And that's fun for me. I enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Do you do work for zoos? We do. We do. We've done rock work, artificial trees for zoos. And um, mm -hmm. I was wondering, the, the, the chemicals, the materials you work with, are they, they don't sound too healthy. Um, the, some of them aren't. You have to be careful. So for the zoos, we have to make sure what we use is completely stable. Um, polygem epoxy. Polygem has an epoxy called zoopoxy. <laughs> that, um, it, it, exactly, exactly. So it's, it's non-toxic, it does not off-gas. Off-gassing is a huge thing that nobody, nobody thinks about. You make an artificial rock out of a mold, great, you throw it in, a, in an aquarium, and any amphibian that gets on it within a couple weeks is dead because they're absorbing the toxins through their skin. So a lot of engineering needs to go into a piece with a zoo. The paint, um, how stable is it? Is it going to come off? Um, you know, vines we've done for zoos that primates have to swing on. So is it gonna hold an 800 pound gorilla? Are they gonna be able to eat the bark off of it? And are we gonna kill one of the gorillas afterwards? So a lot, that's nerve wracking work. Nerve wracking, yeah? We just did some coral work for, um, for the, the rock company that did that mountain and um, they sent us the rock formations and we put artificial coral on it. Well, they did something, I don't know what happened with the rock formations, but um, when they put them in the tank, they all floated to the top of the tank because they were air inside the rock formations. So they had to rethink the whole thing, drill holes in them, weight them. So a lot goes into the engineering of, uh, of a zoo piece. It could be really tricky, it could, it could ruin you. So, um, but we've done it and I try to be really careful on taking jobs like that because it's just, uh, it's nerve wracking because you don't know. A lot of, the, there's, no, uh, there's no set formula for what you would use. So you have to research everything that you're, you're using and you know, hope and make sure that it's not gonna affect the health of these animals later. Whether it off gases, is toxic to touch, or whether if they break a piece off and eat it. I'm gonna say, it's off gas, it's fine, but what if they break it off and eat it? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about uh, sort of the proprietary nature of some of this. And, uh, mm -hmm. Have you had a situation, or are there any inclinations of this, or indications of a situation where you do something for the Museum of Natural History and they say, all right, these leaves are so good that we don't want you to use these molds again. We own the, you know, they, sure. they are in effect our leaves and you can't use them? Sure. Has that happened? Um, and how do you get around that? We, um, we got into a situation that uh, we, we started doing so much work for them that they called us up one day and they said, you have the largest inventory of a and H molds anywhere. I said, okay, so some of these we're fine to use, they don't care. Some of them, they buy the copyright from us for $1. Okay. And we're not allowed to use the mold. Yeah, so in some situations- So it's like rocks and leaves or what are they- No, it's mainly animal models. Okay. Mainly animal models, yeah. Wow. So, um, I guess, uh, you know, a, a rock, I don't know if we can put a copyright on the leaf. Yeah. You know, but a sculpted animal model that has character, it has the artist's hand in there, you can see. Um, if we're using any, uh, doing research at their facility, they'll slap a copyright on it. So, and yeah, it could be, it could be tricky. Yeah. Yeah. But usually they're pretty good about it. Yeah. I mean, AMNH is a great institution, so.
So usually they're they you know they're pretty good about what we do. Is there somewhere else in the world where there's the enthusiasm for this is greater than in New York and London? Um, no, I think it's I think it's starting to spread. Now, do you mean for uh, which end of it? For the animal and plant reproductions that are that are that look like the real deal. I think that's growing. Um, what we've seen is in museums over the past several years. Uh, I'm going to con contradict myself in a minute here, and I'll explain. Uh, over the past several years, the museums have been going less with taxidermy and more with sculpted animals because political correctness. Um, they're more durable. Again, these traveling exhibits are huge. So a, a sculpted animal is going to be much more durable in withstanding the crating on crating, and also permits. We did uh, several pigeons for the Darwin exhibit. I forgot where it went. They couldn't let it in the country because pigeons are protected there. So that's why they said, you know, they call us up in this tizzy, you gotta make a model. So because of situations like that, they're starting to use more models, artificial fur, because those just the permits to travel, these things are ridiculous. We actually, a funny story real quick, we did um, the exhibit was going, I think it was going to Brazil, and we had Galapagos tortoises in there. Someone forgot to put the permits in the crate for the tortoises to get down there. They were taxidermy tortoises. So the exhibit was opening in a couple days. They call us up. We need you to fabricate two tortoises by tomorrow night. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, sure, no problem. So they sent us to the museum. There was, we didn't even sign a contract yet. They got, they got us this tortoise out of the collections. The scientist is there watching us. He said, you can make a mold off of this, but you gotta be very careful. We start to make a mold. Someone walks in the door and says, you can't make a mold of this because you don't work for the museum and you're not union. So they had to get two union employees to come down and put alginate on this tortoise. Well, one scale came off of the tortoise's head that was the size of the head of a pin. The scientist freaked out, said, forget it. You're not making any more molds. That's it, shut the whole thing down. Take what you got, go back to the shop, and start fabricating from scratch. So we get back to the shop, and we're making this thing from scratch. And it was, it was just one of the worst things I've ever experienced. I mean, so hard. And I knew it was bad when at like 2 o'clock in the morning, the, uh, Steve Quinn showed up at our door at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, how's things going on the tortoise? Are we going to have these? I'm like, Steve. I'm so tired, we have another guy there working. I'm like, I don't think, just tell him, we're not gonna be able to do this. He's like, you don't understand, heads are gonna roll. We have to get this done. When he rolled up his sleeves and started sculpting with us, I knew things were bad. I knew things were bad. So we finished those tortoises at seven o'clock in the morning. He took them to our crater, had them crated up, flown down there. They did not believe they were models and they seized them at the border and they missed the opening of the show. So all that work was for nothing, for nothing. Unbelievable. But, so the models, they, 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 were. they thought they were real turtles. They thought they were, they were taxidermy specimens. How did they verify that? That's exactly what you have to do if they cut into it. And I guess they didn't even want to take the time to do that. I don't know what happened, but yeah, so I think those are sitting in storage somewhere oh, still because cool. of that. Yeah, yeah, that they didn't even bother. Wow. Um, but yeah, so the models have become very popular to avoid problems like that. But there are situations now where there's some curators that do not want models. And I kind of sit on the fence with that because I, I look at it this way. If I brought one of my kids to a museum to see an exhibit of an animal that they may never get to see, do I want them to see that animal, or do I want them to see some artist interpretation? You know, technically, the way, with museum budgets and they're starting to try to do things quicker and cheaper, some of the models you see out there look like something, you know, that, that's not even fit for Disney. So when you're, they did that with the dinosaurs, for example. You know, they fabricated, spent all this hoopla fabricating this dinosaur, and one of the girls we know brought her nephew there, and he's like, yeah, but it doesn't move. You know, because you know now we have animatronics and things like that. So, um, in a lot of respect, the taxidermy cannot be replaced for things like that. So I kind of sit on the fence with it. 
What is it? Maybe one one final question. Um, mm -hmm. And um, after, yeah, just, just absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, but we mentioned these guys in the beginning, and I'm just dying to know what you did for them, uh, which goes back to Bill Gates and Donald Trump. Oh yeah. And, uh, <laughs> what, what exactly did they hire you to well, do? And Donald Trump, Jr. Like Donald Trump Jr. is is a huge sportsman. Okay. Matter of fact, if you don't know that by now, it was just all over the internet. They were uh, they hunt all over the world, and we did some taxidermy for them. But, uh, and it just actually turned up on the internet. Somebody actually took photos of them on, or someone had photos of them on Safari, and it was like all over the internet, just blown out of proportion with them as these murderous killers. So I guess. What were they hunting? They were they were in Africa, and, and uh, Donald Trump Jr. had shot an elephant, uh, and they have a picture of him standing there, like cutting off the elephant's tail with a knife in his hand. I mean, it couldn't have been it couldn't have been any worse. I mean, it was just. Absolutely horrifying, and I feel bad for the kid because elephants are hunted quite a bit. In some areas, they're so overpopulated that the government culls them, and that's what they call it. They're, they're culling them. So for for these guys to go there, I mean, they pay a fortune to harvest these elephants, and that money does go back into the conservation. That's what pays the guys to uh, you know to patrol these areas to cut down on poaching and everything. But you know, the media never tell you that, and it's hard to believe that when you see a guy standing there with the elephant tails and the bloody knife. Yeah, but uh, and Bill Gates uh, did a uh, did a sauna in his house. He wanted he wanted the rock work in the sauna to fit his body perfectly. <laughs> so the rock, the, the seats in there had to fit him perfectly in there. Yeah, do you have a Bill Gates mold? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I probably wouldn't even be able to say anything even if I did. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, you, you never know. You never know what's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we get so many bizarre phone calls, and like I said, I, I enjoy it. We love it, you know? One of our landscape uh, designers called us the other day and said, we need help with a project we're trying to build. A client has a, has a jacuzzi in the backyard, and she wants lit wine bottles on the wall spilling water into the jacuzzi. She, I don't know if she'd seen this somewhere, and he's like, how do, I, how do I do this? How do I light up the wine bottles? And how, do I, how are we going to make this? Is it going to explode in the, in the winter, you know, with the glass? And I'm like, you know, it, it almost seems like you got to build like a giant light bright because she wanted all different colored wine bottles. And that's what they did. They, they, he was actually able to do this himself. They got wine bottles, they stacked them into this, these wood frames, filled it with a black epoxy, and put, put a light box behind it and put the tubing coming through there. So now, just above her jacuzzi, there's a whole wine rack of all these different colored wine bottles. They light up and they all pour water into the jacuzzi. And you're, the moral of this is when you get the call from some complete nutcase, okay, I would like to have like, you know, my coat hangers all be like giraffes or yep. whatever. You, you think, I hate you or do you think I love you? I love you, because I'm just as insane. Absolutely. When I travel around, I just, I always look at things, I'm like, that would look amazing in a living room. I look at things, you know, for years, I've been wanting to build a shower that's a coral reef. That you walk into this shower and it's just coral everywhere, coral heads. I am, I am, absolutely, absolutely. You're converting coral to your business. I am, I am. It's, it's just absolutely uh, insane. And uh, it's, it's this, this young lady right here is my girlfriend, Heidi. And how she puts up with me, I have no idea. And it got to the point, not too long ago, we were, some, we were in a museum looking at it, and I'm like, that's just such a cool exhibit, really cool. And she looked at me, she said, yeah, I look good in the living room, right? You know, it's just, I'm just crazy that way. I just, I think it would be uh, just amazing as these people start to look for ways to theme out their houses. This is the future theming out your house, because what else could you possibly do? You can do the best woodwork in the world. You see it everywhere in landscape magazines, the hardscaping that they're doing, but there's limitations to that. Now they're starting to look to industries like ours to figure out what else can we possibly do. Killer whale hanging from the ceiling. Why not? Why not? If you're into that, why not? So it's the shock and awe factor. So I think that's, that's where the future is. So I think you need to embrace these people, open up your imagination, and, and it could be profitable and fun for the designers. And you don't have like a little moral twinge or I, I do. There, there's some things I will not do. I'm not joking around about it, but there's, there's some things, uh, you know, if I don't think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tasteful or just not right, because we got clients that say, you know, I want, I want this animal here and another animal on top of it and bird flying off. I'm like, you know, it's, it's too, it, it can't look like Noah's Ark crashed. 
You know, you just, you don't want something ridiculous. So I will pick and choose, you know, what we're going to do to save my reputation because they're going to walk in the house and say, oh yeah, he did this for me. So I, I am, I'm a little careful and things like that. But I think it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Are, are all of you students or anybody in the business? Is there anybody in the design business or anything? Anybody afraid to say? <laughs> no. But it, it, it's a, I, I think that is the future though. I think that's important to touch on because we're, architects are just falling in love with this material because they're, I, I guess they hit the situation where they hit the wall and what else could you possibly do? You know, what else can you do for this client that has everything? Everything. That, that little waterfall in that backyard, that horrible waterfall that we replaced, you know, that guy's house, we walked in his garage and he had a three car garage with, uh, with hydraulic lifts over each car and there were cars on top of each one. And I looked over there and there's a Bentley, a Lamborghini and a Ferrari. And then on top there were three other cars that I, I don't even want to know what they were. So these are the type of clients we're dealing with. But it's, it's fun. It's, it's a lot of fun, and you know they allow you to flex your artistic muscles. I don't know if you even drove them. You know, I mean, there there was a guy there cleaning one of them, and he was saying that he comes there every couple of weeks and cleans the details of the cars. Uh, yeah, at least they were uh, they were cars above the other cars, not killer whales. And, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, so we have hope. we have hope that maybe maybe he'll order a killer whale someday. Well, cool, George. Thanks. That was that was amazing. My pleasure. If, if you guys like the talk to, uh, tonight on May 1st, we've got uh, Jay Kirk, who's the author of uh, Kingdom Under Glass. Uh, it'll be another night about a kind of historical taxidermy and Carl Akeley, who, who came up tonight. And uh, hopefully George will be in the audience. So uh, yes. I've, uh, I've met Jay Kirk, and the book is actually fantastic. I would definitely come out and see him speak because he's very interesting. He wrote a great book, and uh, Carl Akeley's life is just amazing. I mean, you want to talk about a man that just does not get the credit he deserves. To, I mean, he was mauled by an elephant, he was mauled by a leopard, survived everything. The man invented the Akeley camera, he invented gunite, uh, he invented the gun, the spray gun, he invented the concrete gun. I mean, this man was just incredible. So, um, it's, it's, it's a good read, it's yeah. a good read, and he'll be a great guy to be, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for having me, I appreciate it.